Good afternoon and welcome to the webinar Talking Treasury Trends 2023. My name is Prakash Anthony and I'm the Head of Banking and Capital Markets Practice at ITC Infotech, a leading IT services provider. With me today, uh, we have Pedro Porfirio, Head of Treasury and Capital Markets for Americas at Finastra, as well as Lorraine Verdier, uh, Chief Technology Officer, Financial Services Industry at Microsoft. Now, before we begin, I would like to draw your attention to a, a few housekeeping points. Firstly, uh, this is a live event and the webinar is being recorded and the recorded session will be available to you shortly afterwards. Secondly, feel free to post your questions on the chat as and when you think of them. You don't need to wait for the Q&A session at the end. And finally, if you're having any technical issues uh, in hearing us or seeing the slide deck, please do let us know on the chat and we will have our support team uh, reach out to you. With regards to the agenda, uh, we will have three short but focused presentations. Firstly, uh, Pedro um, of, will present as his perspective on the business drivers and the functional trends that are relevant to Treasury capital markets uh, for the coming year. That will be followed by a presentation from Lorraine uh, who will talk us through uh, the technical and compliance uh, aspects relevant to the financial services industry. I'll follow uh, those two uh, by connecting the dots, as in the business drivers and the technical trends, and what value proposition would a modern uh, digital treasury uh, would bring. Uh, finally, we will have uh, the Q&A session, uh, but keep the questions uh, coming uh, as, as we go through uh, the presentations and we'll answer them uh, during the Q&A session. So uh, without any further delay, I invite Pedro now uh, to present us uh, his thoughts on, on the Treasury uh, trends. Uh, over to you, uh, Pedro. Thank you, um, Prakash. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to everyone. Um, so my name is Pedro Porfirio. Uh, I run uh, the Americas for Finance for Treasury, uh, Capital Markets and Risk. And uh, I'm here today with, in terms of trends and what's happening, uh, I'm going to start with the vicious uh, cycle that financial software is today. Uh, when you take a look at, at banks, they have a really hard time um, adapting to new regulation, new business and new technologies. Um, and without that, <clears throat> it's very difficult for them to compete. And the reason for that, it's uh, the very long select to deploy cycle that you have so if you are a um if a, a a bank or financial institution today you will have to select the software you want to use to fill a certain function or a certain need you deploy such a software and uh after that you need to connect to all other um uh interface to all other systems in your ecosystem you need to test and then you finally are able to operate just to have to select again because you have a new changes or new things that are coming. And that is a cycle that really hurts. What happens on that sort of environment is that banks and financial institutions then when they have a new problem, they need to pick between, you know, adding a new module to the system that you need to do all that and you need to go to an upgrade or you need to go and uh, in implement another system and have another one of these uh, vicious cycles with another software package or vendor. This is really, really uh, a drag on uh, you know, banks accessing innovation or having access to functionality. So what do we do with that, right? How can we fix that? And at Finastra, we are really uh, obsessed with that, uh, with that concept. So when you take a look at what banks need, you you, I believe you should take a look at the life cycle of financial contracts. The first thing you look at is post-trade processing. When every single legally body obligation of the financial contracts need to be fulfilled, checked, and we have stuff like matching, confirmation, payments, and finally you post to the general ledger. If you have every single contract sorted, you can now have a decision support function that knows where to get the information and where to put the information, and you can finally show that information on the front office or what we call workstations. But the mid office function is still support to do this front to back um, uh, process 
need to have additional functions. Those additional functions are usually inside the core software. So when you change something, you need to replace all that. You need to uh, upgrade, you need to add a new module, you need to do a hot fix, and that takes a long time. So we thought, what if all those additional functionalities, right? What if I can use something that allows this core system to access the functionality from the outside? And that is FusionFabric.cloud. It's our app store. So with that, you're able to consume functionality quicker. Instead of months and years, we're talking weeks. So this makes that core simpler because you're removing functionality and you're consuming the functionality off of these apps. Because you as a bank, you're not operating, you're not running any of that, you're just consuming it. We're gonna show some examples. One example here is risk as a service. So what happens here, if you have all your transactions, you send those transactions to fusionfabric.cloud and once that those transactions are there, they are the bank decides to what fintech the bank wants to expose. In this case, let's say vector risk. Vector risk then consumes those uh, that trade information, and they're able to generate a number of risk measures that the bank can then consume. It's very important to note here that this this trend of the market going to platform being open, showing things. We are, when you take a look at FusionFabric.cloud, all the data sets, all the connectivity, all the APIs that we have on our core systems is all there published. It's, uh, it's anyone in the register can see and can consume that. Banks, financial institutions, fintechs, they do not pay anything to use FusionFabric.cloud. The way Financial monetize this is if there is a transaction and the fintech consumes the, the service uh, sorry, the bank consumes the service from the fintech and pays for it. It's very much like the Apple Store. So this is the the, the this platform, this open ecosystems, getting themselves uh, migrating into and being used in financial services. Let's assume now you want to do collateral. You can use cloud margin on FFTC, and if you take a look at the process, it's pretty much the same. It's about simplicity. It's about being open. So, if I were to uh, summarize what we see today as trends that can change the financial industry, right? you can see now on this uh, new is that the steps that we think people need to do. The first one is, if you have something new, try to consume that as an app, as a service. Try to simplify your, uh, your ecosystem. The second thing that we ask for people to have, right? is to simplify the core, make it standard. Don't add stuff to it, again, use apps. And this process of using apps and simplifying the core allows you to move to managed services where you can go into a, um, a consumption state where you're gonna be consuming services instead of having all that, um, uh, instead of having all that infrastructure that is in a lot of cases non-differentiated. So, uh, so if it's non-differentiated stuff, get it out, right? Get it as a service and focus on your differentiation as a business. So that's it to my end, uh, Prakash. Thank you, Pedro. Very, very insightful uh, as always. Uh, thank you again. Um, so of course, we'll come back to you with the uh, Q&A and lots of questions, of course. Uh, let's now uh, go to Lauren. Lauren, uh, I invite you now to present your views on the uh, technology and the compliance trends that are relevant to the financial services industry. Um, I'm going to stop sharing so that you can share your screen. Yeah, thank you. Um, share screen. Here we are. Can you see it? Not yet. You can. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is that okay? Okay, so um, thank you. Um, so I'm Laurent Verdier, uh, uh, I'm at Microsoft. Uh, I'm in the Worldwide Financial Services team, which is the team that uh, articulate the strategy for uh, banking, but also insurance and capital market. 
Uh, I'm a CTO, which means I'm connecting the dots between the business outcomes, the business value, and the adoption of the technology. Um, I have spent myself 30 years uh, in the industry, in, in banking groups in France, uh, as CTO, but also inside uh, some business, uh, some business lines. So what I'm going to to, to show you uh, uh, is the cloud trends in three directions. So the first one I want to highlight here is the fact, and this is what you see here. Uh, oops, here it is. That uh, um, cloud adoption is a reality now in in the banking area. Is um, fifty banks representative of their market it's it's across the world uh, uh, in 2019 december so just before the pandemic and then in 22 so uh, uh, last month and what the slide is showing is on the horizontal axis this is the progression of usage of public cloud for digital work capabilities like microsoft 365 teams and more and on the vertical axis, this is the usage of the platform here, Azure, uh, for Microsoft, from basic usage at the infrastructure level to business outcome led uh, uh, usage of Azure. And so what you see here is um, um, a huge acceleration, of course, uh, due to the pandemic on the digital work, everybody has been uh, using some digital capabilities, teams in the case of, of Microsoft. But also what you see is really banks moving into the advanced quadrant. That means that what they are looking for the cloud usage now is uh, business outcomes. This is really what's driving the cloud adoption and it's a reality uh, now in the industry. So um, next picture is um, around uh, compliance. We know that um, main concerns of when we discuss with banks are around security around compliance so beyond what you see here is just to to uh, remind you that uh, our services uh, are certified against a huge portfolio of uh, uh, of certifications from iso to specific to industry like SOC, like uh, 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 regional certifications so we are doing a lot of investments to demonstrate that our platform is ready for a large usage uh, by enterprise and by banking industry on top of that what we can say and this is again uh, a big trend this is the way cloud providers public cloud providers and microsoft specifically is engaging with uh, the regulators across the world to anticipate the discussion so it's not only about uh, following what the regulators are asking uh, it's really to understand what regulators are asking Understand, understanding why to be able to anticipate on our side the transformation of the products we have or the solutions we have. So it, it's a long journey, it's a permanent journey uh, uh, that we have been starting here in 2012 and, and, and we have regular summits with our customers and the regulators all together to, to discuss around the topics. So uh, just the, the, the key idea here is Public cloud providers like Microsoft are, are not just only following uh, rules. We are working with the regulators really to make possible the usage of the cloud by the financial institutions, making the uh, the transformation that the transformations that are required. Next thing, uh, the next uh, the next idea that I would like to land here in the trends is to demonstrate that. There is not uh, a journey to cloud from the financial institutions if there is not a business value discussion behind. So how do you build business value with cloud? You, you, you build it not only with the efficiency on the economic part or scalability and performance, which is the usual way people are thinking at cloud. It's also about uh, enabling uh, business value from speed to market, data intelligence, digital products and experience, and new digital business models. And of course, there is tons of solutions coming as SaaS, and we are discussing one here, uh, that, that comes to modernize and simplify the business processes. So this is how you build value with the cloud, okay? There are two risk factors, two risk factors to achieve this value, because 
you don't want to destroy all the value that you are you are getting here. Uh, you need to take care of your risk management. So the risk means security. Um, it's not the topic today, but security, security cyber risk is uh, uh, one of the key strengths of, of cloud uh, uh, and, and the compliance we just discussed. So you need to do your homework, otherwise you completely destroy the value. And this is super important. It's about culture. It's about culture transformation, because it's, if it's only to change a technology by another technology, not taking advantage of the technology in the way you work to create value, it means it means nothing. So uh, the way we think at Cloud and, and business value is really through a journey, a journey that is from transforming the traditional operating models to digital operating models. Uh, and it's generating different outcomes for the enterprise, which is not only the cost, uh, like many, uh, uh, still many uh, uh, institutions are, are thinking, but it's impacting obviously the revenue uh, uh, transformation and it's improving even the risk control. So this equation, I let it to you. This is the way to think at cloud and this is uh, translating the, 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 the trends that we are seeing today. I'm done, Prakash. Thank you, Laurent. If you stop sharing your screen, I can go back to I the will, one slide. Thing. I Thank you. Stop share. Oops. Okay. Thank, thank you again, Laurent, for, for that insight. Um, and and of course, you know, technology has been a priority for treasury departments, uh, you know, over the number of years. Um, the more digitalized the processes um, become, the more significant the stake that technology has in treasury becomes, right? So in my view, uh, 2023 will shape the role of technology in treasury even further. Uh, so all, 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 all aspects of technologies will gear towards you know, greater automation, bringing operational efficiency, driving the cost down, and, and making the whole treasury function and management more reliable. Uh, I also believe um, that 2023 will show us how technologies, as you both said, will further advance. Um, and and I, I clearly also see there is a trend emerging. So solution providers like Finastra, um, now they are uh, building not only best of breed solutions, but they're packaging it in such a way that uh, of your, your end clients don't need to buy you know, an entire suite of treasury management, a big monolithic system from the word go. You know, they can pick and choose the actual functional modules that they need. So now I'm, I'm going to talk about some of the key trends that I see uh, emerge uh, or continue from where we are. And of course, I can't do that without talking about the current economic uh, volatility. So if we just um, uh, look at what's going on um, in the post-pandemic world, uh, clearly there is an economic downturn and that's uh, further uh, accentuated by uh, the ongoing war, uh, which has created a massive inflation. The interest rates as a result uh, have risen very sharply uh, in the recent months and the FX rates are extremely unstable. So treasury always has a priority to you know, forecast your cash flow uh, but given the volatility, it's even more important that you know treasury function is able to look at this volatility, the political tension, the economic instability, um, and uh, get to a position where they can uh, analyze these trends and circumstances, and uh, uh, you know do the future cash flow projections to mitigate risk and also ensure there is business continuity um, uh, in, in the years to come. The second aspect that I would I would think is will be continued uh, importance would be automation, right? So, and if you have a well-designed uh, digital uh, treasury system, then of course you know uh, data consolidation, analysis, reporting is taken care of easily without many manual intervention. But also your critical processes like payments, uh, the trade finance, liquidity management, and cash flow forecasting becomes that much more effective. The other trend I see um, emerge, um, um, or it's already in there, is the emergence of the payment uh, hubs or payment factories. And they, they are on the rise and especially for, for treasury functions. Now, payment functions or payment hubs 
uh, not only automate and centralize uh, your local and cross-border payments, but also they are now starting to integrate seamlessly with the rest of the ecosystem. Um, so they not only kind of uh, provide you uh, efficiencies, but also give you a greater transparency and control over where your payments are going. Um, and of course, uh, security will continue to be an important aspect. Um, the ever increasing fraud and phishing scams uh, means, you know, we all need to have mechanisms in place to avoid fraudulent or erroneous payments. Um, now, there are rule based engines and algorithms that are baked into uh, most payment solutions uh, to filter out duplicate payments uh, or fraudulent payments. On top of that, uh, there is sanction screening, which can be enabled if needed uh, on your payment platforms to ascertain that payments are not going through to the wrong parties. So that's the uh, other trend that I see uh, uh, continue. Uh, of course, we can't uh, uh, forget ESG, the environmental, social and corporate governance aspect. Uh, and, and it's a mega trend that will be on every organization's uh, strategy. Um, and the key thing to note there is that the Treasury, I see, will play a very central role in that ESG agenda. Um, so the, um, the importance of big data, for example, uh, or use of um, um, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, those things will promote and reinforce uh, Treasury to be the strategic partner uh, in any organization when it comes to uh, ESG uh, agenda. And finally, I see the, um, the digital uh, uh, strategy will, uh, will continue. Uh, it's, it's about building a digital ecosystem uh, with the data as a connector rather than you know, having digital and then uh, these, these islands or pockets of data. Um, so the, tre the treasurers, um, uh, you know, where in the past they were used to using multiple uh, treasury management systems uh, and connect them to ERPs and you know, then bring the data onto portals. Now uh, they can move on and look at the API based world where they can have real time data in an automated manner delivered directly uh, where it is needed. And, and it kind of creates a single source of truth, uh, real time uh, and automated. So as you can see, and as um, both Pedro and Loren alluded to, so there is a lot of interplay between these trends. Um, so what it means is uh, we need to have a joined up approach um, for, for the for the months and year to come. Um, so uh, what we need to clearly understand is that the, the treasury function uh, more than ever will be acting as a connectors in the business. Not only they will be looking at uh, the business trends and interpret them to understand the impact on their cash push cash positions, for example, but they also act as a bridge between um, various departments in the organization, uh, you know, ranging from IT to procurement to legal to uh, payments to marketing. Uh, everything is connected. And when we say everything is connected, uh, that is where, uh, you know, the emphasis falls on uh, having a digital uh, uh, modern uh, management, treasury management system. So uh, if I quickly talk about uh, the maturing uh, landscape of uh, treasury management systems, uh, and, and, and in here I'm going to talk about a treasury as a service that's matured and offers a quick uh, transitional path to uh, an ideal target state. So if we talk about um, the treasury as a service proposition that we IT Synthetic have put together using uh, Finastra software uh, and hosted on Microsoft Azure, best of, best of uh, both worlds, it offers a significant agility to uh, you know, onboard new products and, and implement you know, any changes seamlessly. And the whole operating model um, has been defined using the industry best practices, which means you're guaranteed to have high degrees of uh, straight through processing, uh, you know, reduced operational risk and, and reduced uh, total cost of ownership. Uh, and uh, now, in, in summary, you know, having a TMS is key to address the immediate uh, imminent challenges um, and uh, it, it will ab absolutely prove to be a key differentiator in the medium to long term um, through collaboration and evolving ecosystem. So uh, that, that's, uh, that's my view on, on, on the six key uh, trends uh, for the next year and why you know, it is important to have uh, a, a digital uh, treasury um, uh, within your organization. 
Um, so uh, thank you for your uh, time and patience. Now we're going to uh, look at some questions from the um, audience. Um, uh, so here's the first question. Uh, this question probably is for you, Pedro. Uh, the question goes, the impact of pandemic on supply chain puts the uh, plus the energy shock and the war in Ukraine have translated in inflation trend that ended up not being transitory. What does that mean to the banks and their treasury functions? Pedro, you're on mute if you're on. Um... Classical. Classic, classic uh, pandemic uh, issue, isn't it? Uh, you're on mute. Um, <clears throat> for the past 20, 30 years, we've seen a, a global trend of lower rates right and and um for the first time in a generation we're seeing uh proper inflation and yeah it's it ended up not being transitory uh at least that's what we believe as central banks are hiking um what i think happens here is that this is going to show very clearly the uh who what are the financial institutions they're not prepared to manage their uh market and credit risks properly uh, it has been a really, really steady state uh, state of affairs with a lot of liquidity. Um, and if you take a look at the traditional way for you to run risks, that means a softer on-prem. And as I said before, the very long uh, state of deployment and running. So we're talking 12, 18 months, if, and you're not even talking about the selection process. Um, so I think the banks are going to win or the banks are going to be uh, more uh, more agile and flexible. And as Lohan was saying, when you take a look at all these issues with security and um, and uh, let's say uh, credibility of, of cloud offerings, if you add that to the fact that if you have a cloud offering that delivers things like risk as a service, as by coincidence you just showed on the presentation, you you end up having your numbers quicker in, in sometimes in days, right? And that's in production. We're doing um, some experiments that have been really, really nice where we do try before you buy it. So we put the client in production during the during the demo and they can use the software and see if that fits their, their setup. Now, if you compare two financial institutions, one that can act like this and is open to use the cloud and open to use all these new technologies, versus one that wants to go off of the standard uh, type of deployment. I mean, I would pick, for me, the one I would pick as a winner is, is, is a clear pick. So, um, it, and it's amazing because you have cloud enabling this, right? You have this um, platform economy that allows now financial institutions to really go quick but still a lot of a lot of these banks are still stuck on like 80s and 90s in, term, in terms of infrastructure. Absolutely. Uh, th thank you, Pedro. Uh, there's a question, probably this one is for you, Lauren. Um, so I know you just showed us a slide with uh, 90 plus um, regulatory regimes and, the, and how uh, Azure is compliant with all of them. But here's a question for you. Uh, we know that Microsoft Azure is extremely secure and compliant with regulations applicable. Uh, if there are some players who are yet to make the transition and need convincing, what's the confidence you can provide? I think, um, again, I, I, I think um, we need to make the cloud uh, ready for uh, being used by everyone that needs to build business value. That means that the level of requirements we have on the on compliance and matching the, the requirement of the different regulators across the world is there. Uh, uh, so I'm super confident. And to be honest, uh, we can use two examples. You have the GDPR, GDPR in the uh, European Union, you know, when it's about data protection. We anticipate it, we transform our products. And even we have been using these uh, rules inside Microsoft Worldwide, thinking this is the best rule for data protection that exists across the world at this time, uh, at least. So this is how we do it. 
Uh, we have an, another example today around DORA, which is a coming uh, new regulations about resilience, uh, which is saying that uh, the, the, regulator, the regulator is looking to make the financial services super resilient and not depending on external factors. And, and again, we anticipate and we transform what we need to transform to make it. So I would say um, we are learning a, a, a lot as we are uh, uh, working with regulators. We are implementing a lot. It's not just for fun. It, it's really deep uh, engagement uh, on our side. So I'm, I'm, I'm really super confident. Sure. No, thank, thank you, Lorraine. Uh, Petro, probably this is another question for you. Um, uh, and it's quite relevant to what you were talking about in terms of, you know, FFDC uh, and, and, you know, your services on the cloud. Uh, when you decompose all enterprise solutions into segregated, callable microservices, who's going to take care of managing these many services to match the end-to-end -end business processes? Oh, that's an excellent question. Uh, because... Uh, it, we a lot of people try to do that in the past 10 years right and uh, and i haven't seen a case where it worked and i think one of the issues here is that you relied on a single entity to provide to you all these microservices so when you take a look at um at uh, the usual software vendor in this industry uh you have this thing about bringing to the core that goes back to this vicious cycle where the software gets bigger and bigger and what usually people do, they take the things from the core, but keep it as microservices in the in their own ecosystem. Um, we're doing something different. Uh, the first thing that I described is a little bit like BlackBerry, where you have a closed system and everything that you need to do that you consume is inside that system. And you can make the point that that is rather robust and security and all this other stuff and makes it a very, very uh, unique proposition. Then you have something like Apple and the iPhone or Google and Android, where you actually have a robust, clean, simple um, uh, operating system, and then you add apps on top of it. And the only thing the App Store does, it's basically, of course, commercialized, but manage this API ecosystem. So I think that if you have specific pieces of functionality that you consume as a service and those APIs and the communication is open, meaning it's published, like what we're doing, I don't think you need necessarily a central, a, a central entity to tell you what to do. As an example, when we do this risk as a service, you have a risk data set on data share that anyone can publish their data there and the fintech can consume. So we're not controlling, but we're publishing the format that people can communicate if they wish to. So it's very different than, you know, myself controlling and keeping the APIs and the data models as, a, as an unknown. So I force people to use my solution. Uh, what Finastra is doing is moving from a us providing software to orchestrating an ecosystem with eight, 9,000 banks that are our clients. I think that's a very powerful proposition. So to make a long story short, we're not trying to control, right? We're trying to bring to everyone what's best, even if that's not ours. It's, it's a kind of a different type of approach. Sure thing. No, th th thank you for that. Um, so another question, um, probably for you, Laurent. Uh, how are regulations managed? Uh, generally, countries would want their data in their own country instead of, uh, you know, uh, in another country over cloud. Is this seen as a challenge or uh, is there a, a solution? Uh, that's a question from uh, Kareem, SMD Saudi. Thank you for that question, Laurent. No, thank you for the question. It's super important. So, um, uh, in our strategy at Microsoft, the way we, we, we answer to that is first, we need to understand what the re regulator is looking uh, when, when he's asking this kind of question. And second, um, we have a strategy of having uh, Azure as close as possible to our customers, which means that we have 
already what we call regions, 60 or more than 60 or 65 regions across the world covering the, the full planet, which means that we have uh, data centers in almost all of these 60, uh, uh, 60 countries are already. So we have a strategy to have the data as close as possible uh, to, the, to the people. Um, and then uh, uh, we, the, the platform allows the customer to choose in which region he wants to be, uh, uh, he wants to see the data stored and processed by well, not only stored, but stored and processed. So they have the ability in Asia to choose, uh, to choose where they want uh, to be. Of course, all of these capabilities are audited. Uh, you can think that regulators are looking at that very deeply. So this is, uh, this is the way it works. We know that there is a big trend around sovereignty, uh, which is one more step uh, on, the, on the data location. So we have solutions. Uh, we are deploying solutions to, to answer this kind of specific questions. Most of the time, most of the time, uh, uh, existing solutions uh, match the needs of our customers. Uh, I think even in the Middle East, uh, Karim, uh, 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 we have data centers uh, over there and uh, so so close to the to the and let's say to the to the region's constraints. So uh, this is the way we do. So we most of the time find the right solution. Uh, to to this to this problem. So yes, there are solutions that needs to be explained, but we have. Can I, uh, Prakash? Can I make a, a comment, Lauren, that I sure, think sure. is relevant <clears throat> here? I, I was a regulated person at banks for uh, over twenty years, and um, I mean, of course, it's one one person's opinion, but I think it depends a little bit what data you're talking about. I see a lot of confusion. And when you take a look at the regulations in different jurisdictions, there is this con concept between primary solution and secondary solution. Right? And you see a lot of banks using Microsoft 365 for their email, saying that they cannot use, uh, the regulator doesn't let them use cloud to store data. Uh, I think the misconception comes from the fact that the regulator is it's very worried about having control on the financial system. and a bank going down is a massive disruption on the system. So the regulator is really worried about the core systems, the primary systems. So mainly if you have a treasury system, a core banking system, or lending, the those financial contracts that I talked, the golden source of those financial contracts, the regulator has a very strong preference, as I see, to keep them in the jurisdiction where they can, you know, rule what's going on. Because if you have those financial contracts in another jurisdiction, that other government decides that no one has access to that anymore, then the bank on the bank goes down. So this is one use case. So I think for that, yes, I see, you know, the regulator is going to be really, really picky. Let's put it this way. But for other things, an example is collateral cloud margin. You need to communicate that information. The communication doesn't have. Um, uh, personable, identifiable information. By definition, that uh, that uh, information is out there. Now, the core information about the financial contracts that the bank needs to run is in their jurisdiction and is with them. But for some of these additional functionalities, and some of them being risk, some of them being collateral, even right reporting, as long as you don't give out control over the golden source and you're just sending that information for it to be processed and do something with it, like a calculator or enriching using rag reporting. And again, no personal, a uh, personal identifiable information. You can use apps. You, the issue of not having the information at the jurisdiction is not that relevant. I don't know if you agree with me, Lohan, on that. Yeah, I do. Uh, yes, of course. Um, of course, I do. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Um, so here's a question again around cloud adoption from one of the participants, Anonymous, but uh, what in your views are key factors for a successful cloud adoption? I guess that's, uh, that's for you, Lauren. Okay, so a um, few things. Um, success in cloud adoption uh, will be guaranteed by if, if there are clear business outcomes that are defined. Moving to cloud just for 
technology. Um, it's too complicated, it takes too much time. But if you have a clear business outcome that will benefit of cloud adoption, which is probably the case of the treasury, uh, 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 then, then it's, a, it's a, a condition for success. I would say um, two other things. Uh, don't look only at technology, look at culture. Um, again, the benefit and the su success will come if uh, you want to change something to digitalize processes or things like that. So this has to be uh, uh, ahead of any work on the technology side. Uh, uh, so, so yes, the cloud will enable a change. Okay, it's not the way around. It's not because you have cloud that then you will change the way you work. It's because you want to change the way you work that the cloud will be enabling this. Okay. And of sure. course, um, from a technology perspective, <laughs> you have some homeworks to do on security and compliance and controls. But whatever, it's not only a question about cloud, it's 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 the evolution of the IT to digital, which is a, a big shift, in fact, uh, that requires uh, um, investment in terms of security and compliance controls. Sure thing, sure thing, thank you. Um, here's a question, Pedro, probably this is close to your heart. Um, where do you embed ESG into the treasury uh, processes? <laughs> uh, that's that's a great question. Um, uh, ESG is, a, is an interesting thing because when you start to, to do stuff uh, like that, then uh, the first step the banks did was to uh, the banks uh, engage where we need to uh, um, you know, be less yield to, uh, get uh, your staff with you know equality between uh, on pay on men and women and uh, you know open to minorities. That by the way, as you can see by the our banner, Finastra is very committed to. But this is a own. It, this is something that the corporation does regarding their own uh, um, themselves. Banks are a very interesting uh, entity because banks facilitate the we are economy. So they facilitate all the business that happen. So unlike most, most businesses, banks can really help on ESG and they can really help on facilitating and incentivizing the businesses that, that they give money or take money or they provide services to become uh, greener, to become more conscious uh, uh, on the environment and on, you know, corporate social responsibility. But the standards are not there yet, right? How do you classify a loan that you give to a bakery in terms of how green that loan is? Is the bakery going to use that to put a heat pump or buy a boiler to, you know, uh, heat the store over the winter? Um, in order to do, in order to be able to to get the data out, um, the treasury needs to make an assessment of what the money is being used to. Uh, on the banking book, or even when he makes his investments on the investment book in the in the whole to maturity uh, book, I am um, is my strong belief, right, that the way for it to do that is to embed um, AI, machine learning, and again use apps to be able to start to figure out how you can control um, uh, how we can start to have an assessment how green your loans are. Not from the standpoint of um, uh, uh, if if you have a, a green bond and that's going to be used only for reusable, but how efficient, how energy efficient, how um, how deep are they in corporate social responsibility? The small shops and the medium-sized businesses, and I think the only way to do that is to have this overlay with apps and the core banking system. We have some of this. Uh, apps on App Store. So the App Store for Financial is about 200 apps that you can start to evaluate and start to use the data. So I think the Treasury is fundamental in that um, in that journey. I'm a member of the European uh, Capital Markets Institute. I'm a, a board member, and one of the things that we discuss a lot is how to how to enable that. It's still in uh, very green, but I think uh, we're gonna. Uh, this is a very strong way for you to enable and monitor um, ESG. Okay, all right. 
Thank you. I mean, the short answer is everywhere. Um, so, you know, you, you need the transparency, as, as you were saying in that example, Pedro, uh, to, to be able to track it. Um, so th that, that is good. Here's another question. Um, solution providers themselves are moving to cloud. Uh, FFDC is a great example of this. Do you see this uh, help accelerate, accelerate the digital journey? I guess, uh, uh, Lauren, maybe you, you can answer that first and then I will come to you, Pedro. Yeah, the, the, and by the way, from what we are seeing, this is absolutely true. We, we see um, the ISVs or SaaS providers accelerating their journey to cloud. In fact, they are ahead of the, of the industry because uh, before he, the, the bank industry uh, uh, can consume services, these services needs to be provided. So um, in the discussion we have with the major uh, ISV, including Finasa, and uh, Petro will comment on that, um, uh, the cloud is perceived as the best way to be able to scale the way they deliver the service to their customers in the most, uh, let's say, efficient, secured way. This is the discussion that, that we are having with most of them. Uh, and, and yes, perfectly true. Um, ISVs, uh, solution providers are ahead of the curve and, and, and they are accelerating in, in the cloud massively. Sure thing. Uh, Petro, from a, a solution, as a solution provider, from your perspective, um, can you address the drivers behind, you know, moving to FFDC, for example, and, and the benefits are obvious, I guess. Well, it goes back to this uh, vicious cycle that I presented at the beginning. It's the fact that when you need something new, the whole process might take two to three years for you to have access to that as a bank, mm -hmm. um, as a traditional bank. And you take a look at the Revolut, the Mozos, the more uh, the digital banks that you have today and their agility is phenomenal and I think it has to do with this fact we're using the cloud and using things there make it as a service um, one of the things that I, uh, I find it fascinating is um, when you go open account at a, some of the digital banks they use facial recognition and some other things on your phone and that's a third party piece of software that's running somewhere that provides a service to do the in the sense the KYC matching your your face with the ID you sent and some background checks on some of the usual banks, you still need to go to the to the to the branch, right? To do the check, and trying to embed that on the ecosystem of that particular bank is almost impossible because it's on prem. They don't, right? You you don't want to go and do it anything on the cloud. So um, I think it's going to be really hard to um, if people don't open up their. Uh, their mind to how much quicker and easier it is if you do things on the cloud. And um, although there is a little bit of, you know, the fear from IT and project managers of banks, because if you do things as a service, that type of engagement, you know, the, the whole the whole machine in the bank that does the upgrades and all that, it loses a lot of need to be. But I don't think a lot of this a lot of these functions realize is that <laughs> the, what they're doing now is not differentiated. And if you start using things as a service outside, you become a very valuable piece of the organization instead of dragging it. So you will start to get that to be able to um, bring innovation and service clients directly instead of just going to this cycle of upgrades and testing and you know, all sorts of stuff. So you take a look at what I think, um, I don't know how often the likes of Google or some others do, you know, their deployments and their testing and all that, but this is where banks should be targeting on being. And the only way they can do that is I think if they use the power of the cloud. Absolutely. I mean, even if you look at all the trends that uh, the collectively three of us spoke, they clearly indicate everything is, is connected uh, and treasury is going to be uh, the bridge that connects all these uh, departments and various other functions. So it is absolutely important to embrace uh, cloud and digital uh, to your point, Lauren. So it's good. Um, I don't think we have any more questions. Uh, anything you want to add to as a closing remark, Pedro, Lauren? 
Well, I just want to add uh, one comment on what just has been said. Uh, think at uh, innovation, the, the, the fastest way uh, innovation can go to market and be consumed by final users like banking or, or other institutions is through the cloud, okay? Because there is one point of delivery and then it can be used as a service uh, uh, by, by everyone and uh, it allows a super quick uh, access to innovation. And, and just think to uh, quantum computing, do you think that people will install quantum computing in the data center? I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> so so uh, uh, think of this kind of thing uh, uh, and you will uh, uh, probably see the value that the cloud can bring uh, uh, in, in this kind of situation. Sure. Now, Pedro? Uh, it's, I, I, I don't think this can be stopped. Uh, I like to make a parallel here on the 70s and 80s when um, a, a Japanese came with um, their new types of, you know, uh, assembly methods and just in time and all that. And the quality of the Japanese cars they're getting to the US market increased massively. And um, the, the US manufacturers had to, uh, to the verge of bankruptcy adapt and change their ways of doing things to survive. Um, I think we're going to start to get into the point uh, with financial institutions where um, the very large financial institutions, they either will need to adopt this or they're going to be in serious trouble just because they're not going to be able to compete. Uh, one of the biggest difference between the regular industries and banks is that they're so um, important for the economy as a whole. Right? When you have crashes, they're not um, uh, financial services related, like it what happened in 2007, 2008. These crashes, these shocks are usually much, uh, the economy absorbs them very quickly. But on financial institutions and financial system shocks, those take a long, long time to recover, as we've seen with still the great financial crisis. So, it's going to be a very interesting times for financial institutions and technology in the, next, in the years to come. Okay. Thank you, uh, Laura and Pedro. Uh, that was very uh, insightful, useful. Uh, now, that is all we have uh, today. Um, so if uh, there are any questions that you think of, uh, please do uh, get in touch with us. Uh, and, and we will do our best to um, uh, reach back to you with, uh, with an answer. <clears throat> our contact details are on uh, the slide. Uh, if you wish to contact any one of us uh, from Microsoft and Astra or uh, ITC Infotech to talk more about uh, our treasury solutions and cloud uh, journeys and the like. So uh, it just leaves me now to thank uh, you all the attendees for your time and attention. Uh, and uh, a special thanks to Lauren and uh, Pedro for your invaluable insights. Mm -hmm.